What is up, everybody? Welcome, welcome to Wishing We Were Fishing podcast. As always, Dustin Clark here with my co-host, Matt England. And today we've got a very special guest. I'm super excited. I am not going to try to pronounce his name. Matt, why don't you give her a try? Well, we're very honored to have the district biologist covering the eight eastern counties there in eastern Illinois, and his name is Jimmy Garavaglia. We like to call him Jimmy G, so we don't mispronounce Jimmy the name. G. Jimmy, thank you for taking your time. And uh, all these podcasts have been super exciting, but this one I have really, really been looking forward to. So yeah. thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for reaching out. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to, to the podcast today. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and just jump on in? Um, you know, probably some of the number one questions I get asked as a guide mm -hmm. regards to the spawn. So, Jimmy, we got a few questions and uh, take your time, answer them as thoroughly or as uh, however you feel the best to do that, you know, in layman's terms for a lot of us. For uh, me, especially. Yes, I, I'm sure one, I'm yeah. one of those yeah. guys that. I'm just going to be over here mostly listening and taking notes because uh, a lot of a lot of interesting uh, information we're going to grab today. So, and I am, you know, I just I just spoke about this. Uh, we're this is going to be one of the most informational uh, podcasts we've had yet, and this is exactly what people have been wanting to know. Mm -hmm. All these single questions. So, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started on that spawn? Um, let's go over some of the depths. What depth do you? see the crappie spawning on lake shelbyville yeah so let me start off this is going to be kind of a podcast wide kind of theme here i don't want you to think i'm being like a fence sitter <laughs> sure but there's going to be a lot of things where i'm going to be like well it depends right yeah that's sure. how biology works yes um and so I, you know if, if there's a specific answer i'll give it to you a lot of times it's going to be well it depends right um and so you know sometimes that's going to depend on where we're at right are exactly. we talking Illinois? Are we talking other parts of the country? Um, you know, something else is going to be right. We're talking about crappie. There are two species of crappie. Um, and, and my master's thesis was on crappie. And one of the kind of the major driving, major driving factors of it was what are the differences between those two species? Right. So, you know, some of the stuff we're going to be talking about today, we're going to be talking, you know, kind of how those species are, are different too. So spawning depth is a great example of that, um, of, of both those situations. Right. So, one of the things that kind of um, through research done across the across the range where crappie are um, that has shown to kind of affect spawning depth is turbidity. So when water's clearer, the fish are going to be a little bit deeper. When it's turbid, they're going to be a little bit shallower. That's just kind of a, you know, an overarching kind of uh, trend, um, you know, and that kind of makes sense, right? If you've got super clear water, those fish aren't going to feel safe in right. the water. Absolutely. You, you know, you've, got, you've got birds, you've got, you know other predators, you know, they're going to want to be a little bit deeper. That water's chocolate milk, you know. Um, I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen it where there's, you know, dorsal fins sticking out of the water. They're so shallow, right? right? So that's kind of your range. So, you know, research has shown there's, there. I mean, there's kind of some really, obviously, just about out of the water and then pretty deep. But a, a good general rule is probably one to ten foot um again depending on turbidity um, one of the interesting things is white crappie seem to spawn a little bit shallower than black crappie um and again that can you know depend across the range um there's there's certainly overlap in the depth that they're spawning in um you know and, and some of that is just evident in the fact that you know we have um hybridization between the two in in some water bodies right and that's something i think we'll probably cover later um but yeah, that's that's kind of the the idea, you know, one to ten foot's a pretty good range, um, you know, where habitat is can affect that too, right? You know, they're they're going to want good uh, sediment, you know, more solid sediment. They're not going to want to, you know, put put eggs and and have their their kind of nest depressions that they make in super silty stuff where the eggs will fall into that and and suffocate because of lack of oxygen, right? So, um, you know, we're we're good spawning habitat's going to affect that as well. Um, at what age do you find out on Lake Shelbyville that the female, the males and females become sexually mature enough to, uh, do the spawning process successfully? Yeah. So, um, I don't have data from Shelbyville specifically. Um, I, I actually probably do for my master's thesis. If I was to look back at that and I'm just now realizing that would have been kind of interesting because we did, we did look at uh, some of that, but generally the, there's not too much of a difference. Um, for the most part, 
two-year-olds have been shown to be able to spawn, um, but most fish are spawning by three is, is typically, you know, and, and some of that's going to depend on um, the growth of the fish and the condition of the fish, right? So if you've right. got a super slow growing fish, you know, they may not, they may not get to that, um, that point, but it, usually when fish are hitting about that six inch mark um, through, through, through research that's been done. Um, is, so is year sort of two, wet. you're saying that that female, that male and female are going to be in the six inch range and they're going to be sexually mature? Well, <laughs> so because of the different studies, right? Some of them have found it around, you know, some are spawning by age two, others in age three. Um, but the, the six inch mark was kind of like, once they get past that, yep. um, you know, and, and it's, it's when they get past that, right? So if they get past that six inch mark in July, they're not spawned until that next year. Right, right, right. Um, right. So, so where that, where that lands, um, is sort of, uh, you know, lake dependent and that sort of thing. But yeah, in Shelbyville, and we'll get into kind of the age and growth stuff, I'm sure, later on. But uh, more than likely, you're going to have a, a good number of uh, two-year-olds spawning. Um, you know, what percentage, I don't know for sure. Because um, that, that's kind of where it varies quite a bit. Because you're right on that line of, of you know, where they start getting into sexual maturity and can start spawning. But right. definitely by age three, everything is. And I would assume that some of those two-year-olds, they were born early in the spawn the year before, you know, two years before that. They might be more apt to be mature at that time. Say one was spawned around May 1st. You know, he would, mm -hmm. it would have a time to catch that in two years from then. It might be one that could have a chance to be successful. Yes, as well. Yeah, if that growth trend, I'm just trying to think through some of the research. If that growth trend follows that fish through, then yeah, that might be a fish that gets bigger. It's really interesting with fish growth, right? So, you know, those those later or the sorry, the earlier spawned fish are typically spawned in colder water, and the later ones are spawned in warmer water. And sometimes you can actually see those fish catch up or even pass, depending on kind of how those growth rates are, are, are caught. So sometimes they catch up and they're equal no matter what. Sometimes that trend kind of keeps up or, um, you know, a lot of times even just individual fish, right? Right. Um, you know, a, a, another trend we'll be talking about with a lot of the data we're looking at, what we call wild units. That's what my stats teacher used to call them. Um, you know, these, these parameters taken from nature is a lot of this stuff's going to follow what we call a bell curve, right? So you're going to have, you know, a few starting on, on kind of the, the minimum end of whatever we're looking at a few on the, you know, on the far end. And then it, it kind of comes up to a peak and that's just a, a natural way that, you know, stuff, stuff varies, right. When you've got your averages with kind of your outliers on the edge, you end up with this, with this natural curve. And um, yeah, you know, the same is going to happen with the timing of the spawn and, and when those fish are releasing, the same is going to happen with the actual, you know, size and growth of those fish. Um, but yeah, I, I would think, um, you know, for sure, whatever's whatever's going to cause those fish to be a little bit bigger if it's earlier spawned, you know, or just individual good genetics, fish. yeah, in, so, individual fish, right. just like a person, you know, they might be six foot tall in sixth grade, and they exactly and, right, or, right, or right. never going to get to that uh, height. Now, uh, you're kind of speaking about the bell curve. Now, could you kind of explain to us how many eggs are in a mature crappie? I mean, I'm sure there's outliers as well. Yeah. So um, one of the interesting things, white crappie tend to have, um, you know, if you're comparing apples to apples, you know, as far as size, age, that sort of thing, white crappie tend to have more eggs than black crappie. And that is one of the reasons why when you have a smaller lake or a pond, um, and, and let me preface by saying ponds up to a certain size shouldn't have any crappie um, because they will typically overpopulate either species. But, um, you know, when you're looking at larger ponds and, and folks are recommending crappie, um, you'll notice it's always black crappie. And the reason for that is they have less eggs and they're a little bit less apt to overpopulate, cause, you know, stunting and that sort of thing. Um, so kind of right off the bat, we've got that species separation. Um, within those then, there's been um, several research projects that were done that kind of looked at this. Um, there, there can be a lot of variation, you know, which is typical. Um, one of the things that has been shown to kind of drive that variation is the health of the fish, right? That's probably not too surprising. If you got a healthy right. fish, they're going to probably have better quality eggs. They're going to have more eggs, um, you know? And that was, oh, I think it was a uh, Heidinger paper and maybe one of his students. Um, they had a, they had a very low density population of crappie and those fish had 
a lot more eggs than, you know, some of the other studies had found, but you know, those, because there were less fish, they had really good growth, right. They weren't competing for food. Um, and so, uh, you know, with all that being said, um, and I actually, I meant to do some math on this, uh, but basically, um, what we find, so I took the averages from a couple of different studies, 177 to 304 eggs per gram of fish. Okay. <laughs> And I meant to do some math on that so that folks could figure out what that means in like, like what does a one pound fish have? And I forgot to do that math this morning. Um, but you know, yeah, you could, you could take that math, that kind of, that range. Um, so you're looking anywhere from, you know, I mean, smaller fish are going to have less, but your average crappie might have a hundred, 150,000 eggs. Um, that, that study with the low density population, there were some fish with, uh, some females with 350,000 plus. Um, so that kind of, gives you a rough range and then a way to kind of estimate, you know, a lot of that's going to depend on. Um, so another fisheries uh, term, right? We, we have density dependency, you know, if something's density dependent and basically that means, you know, it, it's affected by how many fish are out there. So the more fish there are, they're competing for more food. Um, you know, if, if that's a driver, there's, there's this density dependency. Um, and, and that that's likely going to be one of the drivers, um, you know, for, for how many eggs a crappie is going to have, but, generally speaking it's not gonna you know not gonna it's not gonna range a ton you know you're not gonna have a fish that only has six eggs right right <laughs> they're gonna right. have a few eggs in there um but that range varies quite a bit um you know and obviously like i said right that's per gram of fish so the larger a fish gets the more eggs it's gonna have and then is there a consistency on the success rate of those eggs like what is a percentage like survival, of yeah. a survival rate yeah it's oh is it three to five low is it it's low um and that's typical for and oh boy here's another <laughs> i'll leave i'll leave that term I, i'm i'm forgetting our our selected and case selected so basically there's these kind of reproductive um just in biology in general uh, methods right so uh you have let's say humans right we put a lot of energy and care into a few young versus you know fish insects right blast a bunch of eggs out there and see what sticks, right? right. They're kind of your two, <laughs> your two. And so, you know, with fish, they're not expecting, you know, huge survival from, you know, cause you've, I mean, you're talking from, um, you know, fertilization of the egg, hatching of the egg, you know, and if there's any predation in there and then, you know, those, those fry have to survive both from predators and, you know, they have to switch, um, you know, oftentimes we'll see large, what we call recruitment bottlenecks, um, you know, when, when uh, they have to change diet, you know, as they get bigger. Um, and so you're just, you're dry, they're dropping like flies, you know? Right. Um, but that's the nice thing. You know, if you have, let's say, let's just for argument's sake, you got 150,000 eggs per crappie. Imagine how many crappie there are on Shelbyville. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't give you a good idea. There's Man, a lot. That was what I was going <laughs> to ask. There's, right. there's a lot, you know, yeah. we're talking, we're, we're talking a lot of digits as far as eggs go. Um, you know, and, and, you know, to some extent too, you've got the quality of those eggs, um, which again is, is dependent on on um you know the health of the fish to some extent um you know one of the interesting things with with crappie talking about eggs is um there has been some research that indicates um the females don't release their eggs all at once um or at least not necessarily right um so you know it's not kind of like oh that female spawned you know it's it start to finish all the eggs are out done um you know they, they've been found that you know they'll they'll release some and maybe hold some back spawn hold some back so, you know, something I commonly hear is, oh, I'm filleting crappie. It's the end of the, the end of the spawn. Females still have eggs. They didn't spawn. It's not necessarily the case, right? Now, that, that can be true, you know, if, if environmental variables aren't right. Um, you know, that's that's common in a lot of fish species where they'll, they'll basically reabsorb those nutrients, put them into making eggs for next year. Um, you know, and it's possible those females, likely um, that those females, uh, you know, that don't expel all their eggs are, are exactly doing that. We call it resorbing the eggs. Um, so, you know, that's something interesting too with egg survival, right? So that female's basically not wanting to put all her eggs in one basket, right? Right, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Or right. one nest, yeah. and, you know, um, and that's going to let her spawn with different males. It's going to let her maybe spawn in different areas, um, you know, different water temperatures. Um, so, you know, th there's, there's definitely a reason they're doing that. Um, For sure. Know, it's, it's... it's hard to cut you off there. Like I've noticed a lot that uh, the egg sack will be on different sizes on the same class of fish. So I do know that they're coming in and depositing mm -hmm. some eggs, transitioning back out into the deeper water, holding, you know, they may move areas. They may not move at all, but you know, I kind right. of, I kind of think of the intensity of 
you know, child labor, you know, I'm sure that yeah. exerts some type of an energy to get in there and, you know, drop those eggs and, you know, mm -hmm. they, they may have to go back and get a hundred percent. It's kind of what I tell my clients, like, I know these fish transition in and out and, you know, I've, I always assume that they would go up and down a shoreline as opposed to go to one nest, you know? Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's very interesting. I'm glad that that was kind of a, one of my, uh, you know, what I assumed that's, it's good to know. Right. Right. From observations. You right. Know, yeah. Right. That was happening. Right. Yep. No, absolutely. Yeah. So what is, and yeah, spawning, I... spawning is tough on fish. Um, you know, as far as natural mortality, that's, that's one time where you'll see, you know, fish dying of, you know, quote unquote old age, right. Is during that really stressful time, you know, during, and then post spawn. Um, on average, yeah. what is, uh, when, when the spawn starts to, to about when, when it completes, yeah so um a lot of that is dependent on water temperature um and again uh, uh, yeah, gotta, right. we start off with we start off with species differences right so black crappie and i'm not i'm not going to give very many temperature ranges here because it varies a lot um and some of it you know it's not completely temperature that's just kind of one of the drivers um you know if you got a really late spring and you know the the rate at which that temperature warms up you know might might trigger them too not just necessarily a temperature um on the whole, black crappie seem to spawn a little bit earlier than white crappie. Um, that's been seen in, in a lot of research, um, and it is, it's basically agreed upon. Um, it, again, it's a bell curve. So we're basically looking, um, all the species combined, everywhere from about 50 degrees to 70 degrees, right? So th that's kind of the ends of our bell curve, uh, more or less, from what research has found. So if you draw, draw to the middle... It's what most people talk about. It's your upper 50s getting into 60 is usually when, you know, and when we say spawn, um, I think it's important to understand, you know, at least as far as biologists go, we're talking when eggs are fertilized, right? Now, anglers, and I'm an angler as well, <laughs> the spawn, I, I'm probably fishing pre-spawn, right? When those fish are coming shallow. So that's going to be more than likely at the, at the, you know, the front end of those temperatures, maybe in an end of the forties when those fish start, start, um, you know, actually staging to spawn, you know, so I don't want people coming at me. Oh, the fish are shallow, moving shallow when it's in the forties. Yes. <laughs> that is pre-spawn. Right. So when we, we say at least as biologists spawn, we're talking when eggs are fertilized. Um, and that, that's typically going to be, like I said, probably low or upper fifties, low sixties, you know, with outliers kind of on either end. You know, we've really focused a lot so far on the female end of that. You know, the male crappie is, is just as important. Obviously, it takes two to tango, but, you know, they sure. do a lot of guarding the eggs. And, you know, uh, so could you give us a little bit of insight on, like, what the males are doing during the spawn? Just, you know, as far as keeping the beds clean, keeping them protected. Yeah, yeah. So typically they're going to fan out a bed. It's, it's not quite as nice as a, uh, you know, it's... it's not quite as nice as a largemouth makes, right? They're not they're not spending as much time doing that, but they kind of fan out a depression type area. Um, you know, there's there's not nearly as much research, at least that I've seen. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like yeah, they kind of fan out a little bit of a of a bed and they spawn in that. And one one of the hard things with crappie is if they're if they are spawning in shallow or in clear water, they're deep, so you can't really see them. <laughs> um, and that was kind of something we were hoping to look at with my thesis, and it didn't work out. That's a long story. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, the males are there. They're probably going to be moving in first, right? So, so early season, you're going to see a lot of them, um, really dark males, right? They get that dark coloring up. Um, and that's a know, hormone so spike. Is that correct? Oh, uh, I assume so. Right. Yes. That's a good, that's a good question. I assume that is somehow hormonally, you know, and, and again, probably a temperature, you know, um, you know, temperatures are causing that, right. All those hormone changes to, you know, have the, the gametes ready, both in males and females, you know, for those eggs to ripen, for the milk to be ready. Um, and then obviously, you know, right, triggering those fish to go up. So I'm, I'm sure that's that's what's causing that. The the coloration on the fish, um, chromatophores, I think is the term, um, you know, and, and those can, you know, fish can darken up, lighten up for different reasons, right? Sometimes it's just light intensity in their environment. You know, in this case, it's it's probably, a, you know, hormone for, for the spawn. Um, you know, we've got other fish species that, that have, um, you know, spawning coloration, right? Right. Um, different dar darters and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, Cause that's why I usually, yes. 
Sorry, oh, I, get, I get a lot of people telling me, hey, Matt, I'm starting to see him, starting to catch those males with their tuxedos on. You know, we know <laughs> it's getting close. I'm like, exactly. Once you see yeah. that darker coloration for the first time in on Lake Shelbyville specifically, you do know that you can start going in there shallow and looking for those pre-spawning fish. Right. Yep. Yeah. And you're probably going to find a lot of males, right? A lot of males in, first. Or, yep. You know, the females might be a little bit, you know, deeper offshore. Um, and a lot of people, you know, I've, I've seen people confused too. They think those male white crappie are actually black crappie. Sure. Right. Cause they're like, sure. Oh yeah, they're dark. They're black. Right. 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 You know, so you kind of got to look at that, you know, that, that, um, that, that coloration difference, right. You know, and, and the striping versus modeling and, um, you know, one of, one of the ways, right. I just ID and crappie in general, Coloration's good, right? You, any of us that crappie fish enough, you, you can look, you just look at a crop, you know what it is, right? right. Um, but, you know, f- for those that maybe don't know or those that might be confused or, you know, whatever, easiest thing to do is count those, those hard spines on the dorsal fin, right? So not the soft rays that are in the second part. Um, and it, it's pretty easy for the most part. And there's every once in a while you get a freak, but um, five to six for white crappie and seven to eight for black crappie. It's a real nice thing. You can count it cut and dry <laughs> um for the most part unless you get into hybrids <laughs> you know we we kind of touched touched on that hybrid situation a little bit you know you, we have a lot of cross uh breeding not breeding but cross fertilization uh between the mm-hmm. white and black crappie and then uh that will form the hybrid and then uh am i correct that the hybrid is a uh it's not a fertile fish is that correct it is not. It is so not. hybrids. Okay. Hybrids and crappie are interesting. So, anecdotally, um, on Shelbyville and on Lake Decatur, uh, I've been aging Lake Decatur odalis uh, this winter. There appears to be we've gotten a handful of hybrids, um, mm-hmm. and the reason for that is several, right? So, looking at the fish, they had kind of a, a combination of coloration. There was, it kind of looked like a black crappie coloration, but they were kind of striping in it. it Absolutely, kind of weird, right? Um, but they had, you know, the, the body shape was kind of in the middle and then the spine counts, um, were that of a black crappie. And so, you know, we marked those and they actually come out as, as having kind of a separate, um, growth trajectory compared to the blacks that they have the spine count for. Um, so we're fairly certain now it's not a huge percentage in Illinois. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Epifanio was a researcher at, on the, I'm sure he was with the history survey, history survey U of I. Um, did some genetics work on crappie, you know, here in Illinois, um, at least during his stuff, I think the, the hybridization rate was pretty low. If I remember right now, other states have seen higher hybridization down South. Um, you know, so if, if, like we talked about with the spawn, you got black crappie, white crappie might be spawning in slightly different areas. We've got turbidity affecting it. So there's a lot of reasons why those fish may one be spawning close enough to hybridize and two possibly not being able to tell who they're spawning with right so right. maybe super turbid water you know so even within a lake if you got a super turbid year you know or, or they're spawning in a really turbid area you know that may lead um and those are just kind of hypotheses not yeah. they, i don't know if they've necessarily been proven um but anyways yeah so hybrids are interesting so um even the spine count on a hybrid isn't 100 percent. about three quarters of them um per some research uh, research project uh, about 75 had a, a seven to eight count like a black crappie and about 25 percent of them had a five to six count from a white crappie um, which is kind of interesting um a lot of these so you know you're asking if they're if they're fertile if they're able to reproduce um a lot of that i believe it was the pioneering research on that was actually done um not too far south of here at the sampar biological station um uh blanking on their first names, it was Homer and Buck uh, did the, the research projects on that. And basically they were able to find that those hybrids um, could reproduce with each other and they could back cross with either species. Okay. Um, so, so then you, you, then you start getting into really weird, um, you know, what the fish is going to look like. Right. Cause if you've got, well, you know, the, the first generation uh, you know, from let's say the hybrids, we call that an F1. Okay. And then when they, they could then spawn with another hybrid, a black crappie or a white crappie, and then we'd call that an F2 and those F2s will look different depending on right what they back cross with. So if it's another hybrid, I don't really remember off the top of my head what they look like, but they'll, you know, if they back cross with one or the other, they'll start looking more like that other one. You know, the, um, the biggest fish on Lake Shelbyville I've caught has been a hybrid. Yes. And that sure. is pretty common. So 
there's a there's a phenomenon, a kind of a trend called um, hybrid vigor, and basically it's you've got you've got these two species, um, and and oftentimes it's thought that it's they're not putting as much energy into you know uh, reproduction. That's what I so always they're, they're able thought. To put that into growth, right? But in this case, those those crappie were able to to back cross now. I don't remember off the top of my head if maybe the egg counts were lower. And so, you know, that might have been why, um, you know, the, the, they had more energy Absolutely. to put into what we call somatic growth, you know, body growth versus the eggs. Um, I'd have to, I'd have to look back at that paper. Um, you know, and, and, and even then it's not well understood. Um, like I said, I can't remember if, if we call it fecundity, how many eggs they had, if they were less fecund. And then um, I, I, I do remember based off of that paper, they still weren't sure the long-term ramifications of having those hybrids, right. And, and kind of having those mixed genetics and what that would do long-term for a population. Um, you know, around here, it's such a low amount that, you know, it's not right. We, Absolutely. You know, typically would see, but. Matt, how many, how many do you see on, on the lake when you're, you're fishing? How many hybrids lines? do yeah, we catch? I mean, uh, you know, over a year we might catch, uh, Oh, 250 maybe you know out mm -hmm. of you I was, know i was just curious on how common th th this is you know so you do see quite a bit i mean a, a guy that's not getting out too much ain't gonna see too many but you know the problem is a lot of people just misidentify it you know you yep. really have right. to pay attention to like hey hey yeah. that's not just a black crappie because right. it's got those vertical bars you can kind of see yeah. subtly underneath those speckles so uh I think the people probably catch I more. Just, you're just throwing them back and just thinking it's one thing or not. Even right, right. Yeah, yeah. But like, you know, when I'm at the clean station, et cetera, you know, I'm always talking with my dad and, you know, that's one thing like, hey, there's another hybrid, you know, so we always <laughs> have questions on the hybrid. And I was always under the impression that a hybrid fish was sterile. So it's great to know, you know, because mm -hmm. um, like you say, you start getting F1s and F2s creating, yeah. you know, those freaks. You know, and, yep. and there's some really big, thick back crappie in uh, in in that healthy lake. In a lot yeah. of these lakes that have the hybrids, you know. Yeah, uh, and that's one of the reasons, like for state records, um, you know, for some species and crappie would be one of them. You have to run genetic tests, right? Because if we're going to have separate records for black crappie and white crappie, right. a lot of times those hybrids are those big fish coming in. Um, you know, so yeah, that's it's it's definitely an, an interesting thing, and. Another thing I'll add, because um, I know this is this is something that all, I get a lot, um, I, and I, I, I hear people miscommunicated a lot, um, even within researchers. And so there's a little bit of, some of this is just how you want to use terminology, but um, I'm sure you've heard of a magnolia crappie. Yep. Heard that term, right? Yep. My understanding <laughs> of a magnolia crappie, where I, I, I first kind of saw this terminology used in research, and I'm, I'm trying to remember if it was Missouri, Mississippi, one of them states down south. They basically were making a, a hybrid. And it was a female white crappie and a male black nose crappie. So let's cover what a black nose is. Black nose crappie are a black crappie. They just have a what we call a phenotypic variation. They have this awesome coloring. Looks like you took a, a Sharpie right down the front of their face, right? They are black crappie. That is, they are that species. They just have this weird trait. Um, that trait's kind of cool because you can use it to see, you know, it's basically like a natural mark on a fish. Instead of having to tag fish some way, you know, you, you're able to use that. So that's that's one of the reasons that's come out. And Beaver Lake, Arkansas, I think, is where at least some of those genetic stock came from. There might have been some other spots. Um, but point being, so you have this male black nose, so basically a black crappie with this cool coloring, and then a female white crappie. Now, after they fertilize these two, right, so that's the first level, they fertilize them and they cold shock the eggs. And what that does is it makes them triploid. So it basically they have a, an extra set of chromosomes. Same thing is done with, let's say, grass carp, right, that are sold in the U.S., well, that are legally sold in the U.S., um, because they are not able to reproduce that. So I think this is one reason why this idea that hybrids can't reproduce came about is, so these fish, the idea was crop you overpopulate, if we have these fish, we can stock their hybrid, so they grow really quick, right? Or and, and bigger, it seems like, and then they can't reproduce. So you can you kind of have this put and you know put and take where you're not having to worry about um, you know stunting um, was I believe the reason that you know this was sort of developed and and done. So I've heard magnolia crappie used to 
refer to other fish too, but that's my understanding of what a magnolia crappie, um, at least from, like I said, I think it was Missouri or Mississippi. Um, it's you, If people Google it, they'd be able to. I, it might be Mississippi because it's known as the magnolia state, you know, magnolia okay, crappie. Miss, okay, yeah. Yep. So I, that's, I'm sure that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. Um, we spent quite a good portion there on the spawn. We might switch things up and do some age and growth yeah. talk. Um, first and foremost, uh, how are, how is a crappie aged? You know, a lot of people determine it by size, but I know there's a scientific a way to do it. And you've already spoken about it uh, previously, but could you explain that for us? Yeah, absolutely. So fish are pretty cool. Um, you know, different species are aged in different ways, um, but they all, for the most part, the idea behind it is they've got these hard bony structures that um, continually add layers on. And those layers are added on with a chemical composition in a way that basically lets us count like rings on a tree. Um, so in the case of crappie, we use their otolith. Um, so otolith, oto is ear, lithos, I think these are both Greek, is, um, is bone, ear bone. Literally translates to ear bone. And that's what it is, right? It's this inner ear bone. Um, there's actually three pairs of them. We get the largest because it's right easiest to read um, and, and reads well, um, you, you know, for, from their inner ear, basically. And they'll be, I'm trying to think if I actually have any, they'll be about, about yay big, right? So, you know, you can, you can almost, you can kind of see the rings even with your naked eye, uh, but we use a, a dissecting microscope and, you know, it, it's not too difficult. Um, in fact, I sent you some pictures. Um, yeah, absolutely. Of kind of what those look like, right? So you've got this, the whole otolith, um, if they're thin enough, can be counted. You basically just go from the center, we call the focus and count out um, and you count those rings and those rings basically represent, um, well, Sometimes it depends on what kind of light you're using as well. They'll show up. One will be light, one will be dark, and if you use different light. But the way we're the way I'm doing it, the whiter rings are the winter growth when the fish are growing slower. Um, the composition's a little bit different, and obviously the growth rate's different, and that's that's what creates these rings. Um, so you know, for us, the, typically the standard way to to look at crappie is um, fall fike netting. So we're catching those fish in the fall. You know, so this picture you'll notice you start at the center, you count out, and when you get to that last ring, there's a little bit of growth after that. Well, that represents that growth from that growing season. Um, you know, so depending on the situation being used, sometimes I'll refer to these fish as, you know, two and a half, three and a half. Right. Um, you know, it's it's kind of weird to do that, right? Because in a given year, the growth rate's gonna be faster, you know. So from from the spring when they're born, right? It's gonna be faster spring, summer through fall, through the winter. So it's not necessarily that they're exactly a half a year. You know, they are by calendar, but not necessarily by growth. Um, just throwing that out there. Um, but yeah, so that's that's kind of the, the basic gist of it. Now, that being said, other things can kind of create um, areas that look like false rings. Um, you know, changes in diet, you know, especially when fish change, you know, their diets from like, let's say inverts from bugs and stuff to, to fish. Um, you know, you might see what we call checks. Um, with otoliths compared to like scales, it's typically a little bit easier to, to figure that out because those lines typically don't make the whole circle. Um, and so, you know, a, a lot of that's just experience. And, right. Um, sure. You know, you, you, you read enough of them, you kind of, you kind of get the gist of it. Absolutely. Um, um, yeah. And, and what's, what's even more interesting. Um, you can also at, at times use the distance to each of those. So if you take the, the length of the fish and then the ratio from the center to each of those rings, as like a total length of the otolith um, at times. And there's some argument, you know, there's stats and whatever, but at times you can use that as a, a rough estimate to figure out how long that fish was, because that is kind of correlated with growth. Okay. Um, so at, at times you can do that, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, you, you can basically what we call back calculate and figure out what the length of that fish was at various ages. Um, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of information you can get from, you know, from a, a set of otoliths. So with that otolith being uh, how we age the fish, mm -hmm. what is the crappie's life expectancy here in central Illinois, like Lake Shelbyville? Area? Yeah, so I'm going to start here, right? Crappie can be, I have, I have personally aged crappie out to, I believe the maximum was 17. Oh, wow. Wow. I didn't wow. That. That's... And that might, that might sound good. You do not want to see that in your lake. That means oh, okay. you're having problems. Okay. So 
this interesting thing with uh, fish in general with crappie this if they're slower growing they live longer so these 15 to 17 year old fish they're actually from just down the road uh charleston side channel lake back in 2013 uh this is for my thesis work um those fish were about eight or nine inches right right <laughs> right so that's not what you're looking for right nope. um you know uh there was actually some cool research on it um from EIU, uh, the Colombo lab, uh, they basically found that there was a, a subpopulation within, within the population that weren't switching to eating gizzard chad, to eating fish. So they basically had this body size that they could barely sustain, you know, their, their energy level with the bugs they were eating. So their growth basically stopped, you know, these rings, like I said, the distance kind of represents growth. These rings were just stacked like oh. pieces of paper in a book. Um, you know, those fish, you, you know, they, they, it's not like they, they were two inches and then two and a half and two and three quarters, you know, they got, you know, to about probably six or seven inches and then just stopped, um, you know, and those fish that did, did switch to, to eating fish to piscivory, we call it, um, those, those fish, you know, grew better. Um, so those are the exceptions that way people don't come back to me of, Oh, fish can get however big, um, or however old, not, not, you know, they can, but not in good situations. Shelbyville um you know and and other area lakes um you know with a with a good healthy population four to six years old is what you're looking at um the majority of fish in shelbyville are four years old or younger um in our survey oh i want to say so if we extrapolated you know so so when we do aging we age a small subset of fish and then you know to get ages at length and then we extrapolate that as a out as a kind of a ratio to the whole catch that we had in the nets and even after extrapolating, I think we had two fish at five years old and one fish at six year old. Okay. Um, uh, and that would have been for the 2021 fall survey on Shelbyville. So majority of those fish are four, you know, four and a half, if you will, you know, by the fall um, and younger. Um, and that is all, that was all that, you know, that, that there is white crappie, I believe. Um, now, now I'm trying to remember. I've got it here. Um, black crappie were all four or under. Okay. I wanted to make sure <laughs> I had to get my graph up there. Um, and fun fact. Um, so here's, here's one of the things that you can kind of, um, you know, one, one of the reasons, one of the things we can find with, with age is um, it's figure three in the graphs that I sent. Um, if you notice, there's actually more four year old crappie, black crappie from Shelbyville than three and a half year old crappie what's going on there, right? You know, you typically, you start with your most fish when they're fry and you work your way down, right? It's typically how that works. And so, um, you know, then the question is, is there, was there just a lot of four-year-old fish or are there not as many three-year-old fish? And, and that's what it is. There were very few three and a half-year-old fish. So basically we had a very poor recruitment year for black crappie and because the survey was in 21 and three, it, basically it was 2018. Okay. Um, so that's one of those things we can kind of look, um, you know, thankfully it looks like the spawn from 2019 was good. We have, you know, good two and a half year olds moving in. Um, but you know, so this year we basically would have had very few, uh, four and a half year old black crappie. So okay. growth, whether, whether anglers even notice that or not, it's hard to say. Does the growth uh, rate, I mean, is it like, uh, the food that they're eating? Uh, a lot of people have said like the weather, like down South, you got bigger, bigger crappie is it because mm -hmm. of longer grow season and they're just getting yes. more bugs and all uh, you know other food and they're just more active uh, yeah so you know around here we've got super fertile lakes um you know we they've, they've got there's a lot of plankton um inverts so so you know for certain species of them at least um but uh you know a lot of these fish and again species differences right white crappie typically switch to eating fish quicker than black crappie do um you know at least on average from what studies have found um so they've got they've got a lot of food the difference is down there they're eating that food longer and growing longer right so their growth is directly correlated with water temperature um, mm -hmm. at least to an extent right it, it could get too hot which would then slow growth um but uh but yeah that's that's the main reason why those lakes down there you know those, those crop you're able to to they're at growing good growth temperatures optimal growth temperatures for a longer period of time i know yeah. right now um the lake temperature on Decatur two days ago was 42. And I know right now, the, it really? yeah, the water temperature in Mississippi today is 51. So, yeah. you know, that's a, that's a big, that, that only seems, you know, 
nine degrees, but that's a huge, mm-hmm. huge range when it comes to anything happening underneath the water. You know, right, and that's that's probably warmer than average for. Well, we've had a mild, it is, I mean, it is. I want to say a year or so, but it was probably ice covered <laughs> still this time of year. Yeah. Um, During some of your surveys, when you said you were you uh, caught that five year old and one six year old, what is mm-hmm. you know like what are the links and weights on some of those bigger fish that you have caught in your nets? Yeah, so I'm going to go to my cheat sheet. I'm not, I don't want anybody to think I'm that good that I have all this memorized. Um, so. Uh, well, let me start, let me, uh, well, yeah, I'm trying to think of how I want to attack that. Um, most of those fish are going to be maxing out from our surveys. Um, and then see, this is where I, it, I have to remember the two species, right? So on Shelbyville, I'm typically looking a little bit more at the white crappie because they make up more of the population, right? That's kind of the, 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 the dominant species. And then there's, you know, kind of a side fishery for these black crappie. Um, and so, you know, for those white crappie, which do tend to be a little bit longer, um, you know, even at age than black crappie, um, 300 to 320 millimeters. And that's going to be just under 14 inches. I want to say, um, okay. Trying to get up my, my converter here. (laughs) I'm not great at converting. I was going to try, (laughs) but yeah, I mean, you're, you're basically 13 to 14 are Mm -hmm. going to be about the biggest crappie, um, that, that we've gotten out of Shelbyville in recent times, um, at least. And I think that trend holds, you know, pretty constant. That's, that's about the biggest, um, you know, the, so the, the biggest caught in Shelbyville, um, like kind of ever in surveys, um, I was able to look at the database. I did have to kick one out because I'm fairly certain it was an outlier from the early nineties. There was like a four pound something fish. I think that was like a fat finger misentry. Uh-huh. Sure. <laughs> Cause it, it didn't, it, though, it didn't match, you uh-huh. know, the size of it. So I think that was an error. So unless that was some freak fish, I don't know about, um, the biggest white crappie caught in a survey was 13.8, almost 13.9 inches and was just over one and a half pounds. And then the largest black crappie caught in a survey um, was 12 and a half inches and one and a quarter pounds. Okay. Now, I'm gonna put a couple bumpers on that. One, that's out of the DNR database, not necessarily fish that were caught during any like research projects through the INHS, okay. you know, Illinois Natural History Survey um, or anything that wasn't entered into the database for whatever reason, that was just out of the database. Um, two, um, something that was interesting and uh, here it is two of the top black crappie um in out of the whole database are hybrids or suspected hybrids from our 2021 netting survey <laughs> is that right so we basically have some of the biggest fish in our database from both species there were there were individuals in the top 10 um part of that is because we started fike netting um, which hasn't been done for a little little while, so we're getting more fish. Um, uh, you know, and, and some of that I think is just yeah, we've we've got some pretty good growth rates. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, all the surveys show you know we're we're at or above where we would like to be. You know, just for this area, what you know, I'd love to be able to grow two and a half three pound crappie, right? But you right. got to be realistic. Right, <laughs> we're, right. We're at about where you know, where where we we reasonably think we could be. Um, you know, as, as far as growth, I get that um, a lot. You know, people like they want to compare mm-hmm. different bodies of water, you know, and I say, I have zero complaints for an 11,000 square acre reservoir, 28 <laughs> minutes from my house. You know, there's great numbers, right. there's great size of fish, you know, and yep. there's huge schools. And, uh, you know, as a guide, I love getting over those big schools. I like getting to mm-hmm. above the treetops and just bringing them out, you know, and we've noticed that we're catching all white crappie here we're moving in shallow we're catching all black crappie there you kind of talked mm-hmm. about the different diets of species uh, the different species having different diets and it's exactly true you know we're out there in open water those white crappie are catching we're catching them on minnows a lot with a lot more consistency move in shallow throw a hair jig down there throw a small hair jig down there and those black crappie are just right in there but uh yeah. what what do you speculate uh the percentage of crappie in total, like, is it, what's the percentages of white versus black crappie? Good question. Um, just trying to think the numbers we caught kind of the total 
probably 80 20 white to black if i'm doing my math right here maybe maybe 70 30 give or take and that's going to vary a lot um right so i said we had a missing year class basically well i shouldn't say missing a very reduced year class um of of black crappie right so we were kind of missing fish from that um but you know based off of that survey yeah we're about there and this can change um you know environmental variables uh, can affect it um i know through my master's work we were looking at some of this species comparison stuff and i know some you know some lakes and i'm sure this is more common than just this one example but the species the dominant species actually flipped and it was really interesting so the, the reason the biologists figured it out because at the time and this is one of the reasons it's kind of an issue when you're managing both species combined and not looking at them separately the biologists were like yep catch rates are stable and the anglers were like where are all the crappie they're all gone well, then the biologists looked at it a little bit more and they had flip-flopped from white crappie dominant to black crappie dominant. The anglers were fishing spots that were typically exactly. white crappie hot spots, not where the black crappie were. Um, and it, it, this was, I want to say Kentucky Lake maybe or Barkley. It was kind of out that, that way. I want I think it was Kentucky Lake this happened. And if I remember right, oh, this was years ago I read this, but uh, and I actually talked to one of the biologists from out there. But anyways, it, I think they had more vegetation start growing. The water cleared up a little bit, right? And so... Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, I mean, there's theories. My, my theory behind that would be black crappie are more, um, insectivorous, right? So they eat more yep. insects, more, inver you know, invertivorous. Um, and you know, if you've got more vegetation that brings in a whole nother, you know, slew of different insects that eat that and live on that and, and that sort of thing. And that might've then favored black crappie a little bit. And you know, um, Shelbyville you know, lacks a lot of shoreline vegetation. You know, mm -hmm. I think I counted seven cattails last year that's a joke <laughs> you know we just don't have oh, oh i was gonna say <laughs> you found seven cattails on his breast. <laughs> you know we just don't have that uh for the invertebrates to be coming to be inhibiting yeah. that area of the lake so we right. have a you know because i had a speculation i was saying 90 to, 90 to 10 white to black crappie just because mm -hmm. i'm fishing open water where there's going to be bigger schools of fish where i'm able to fish multiple water columns that the white crappie are holding in as opposed to those black crappie you got to get up in some of those shallow creeks you're not going to have the room to have the big schools of fish in there you know sure you're sure. isolating one or two fish off of a stump when we're looking yep. for those big black crappie up in them creeks in those shallower areas you know yeah and you're what you're describing is basically what i found with two two years two springs worth of actually tracking crappie um, and the idea was looking at the difference and that, that was the, the major findings. White crappie were more offshore, black crappie were more inshore. Um, uh, black crappie were a little bit more associated with, you know, coarse woody habitat. Right. Um, I kind of joked, you know, we'd be, we'd be tracking these fish and I'm on the front of the boat with just a whip antenna. So just a wire in the water. So you got to get real close to hear that signal. And you know, I, I'd hear it and then I'd have the driver mark it on the waypoint. And typically how that would go with the black crappie more than anything. We'd go and I'd hear beat and I'd go mark and they'd mark it. And all of a sudden transom would hit a stump. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> right. Like, well, there we go. We've, we've got some coarse woody habitat there. That's right. Um, so yeah, what you're describing is what um, that research found and what, you know, other kind of hints at, at what other research has found. And, you know, that vegetation is not just for food, right? That's going to be for um, young a year. You know, Absolutely. To hide in and live right, in. right. Um, you know, the, the history survey just did some research, some, lab experiments and, and published a paper kind of showing the differences in, in black crappie and white crappie um, and their, their ability and strategy, I guess, to, um, to evade predators, uh, you know, and, and yeah, so vegetation, um, you like, you know, that's fine. My soapbox for the differences, turbidity for a long time was looked at because clear lakes had black crappie dominated, um, turbid lakes had white crappie every time you look at turbidity in a controlled setting, the turbidity didn't affect anything. So it's something other than that. And I think vegetation habitat is really what's driving that. And turbidity just happens to be different in those two types of systems. You know, on Lake Shelbyville, uh, for the last four out of five years, we've had really high water. So we have had some yes. shoreline ve vegetations, which has given mm -hmm. probably that crappie spawn a higher percentage for success leading into more crappie. It just, it's, you know, it's a full circle for like the maximum opportunity for those fry to, you know, develop and get out there. And, you know, if they can hang out in six inches of water until they're big enough, you know, to not mm -hmm. be a easy, easy picking for another predator, you know, uh, right. Um, you did, t we have spoke on the 
percentages of white and black crappie. Now, have there been any black nose crappie reported caught on Lake Shelbyville? I believe <laughs> there have been a handful. I looked, I thought there was a few in our database. I thought we'd caught some in surveys and there weren't any that came up for our surveys, but I believe, um, you know, I've only been the biologist here for a couple of years now. Um, I believe um, Mike Mounts told me and he'll, he'll have to correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe he did say that he had anglers report a couple of black crappie, I think. Or My, black, sorry, black nose crappie, black nose crappie. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, the the likelihood is some people brought those in from from nearby nearby lakes. Um, that's not not a good thing. Um, you know, we've got a lot of different fish diseases. Right. Um, largemouth bass virus, which affects largemouth bass, but other other species can be carriers. And that's just an, one example. Um, you know, we've got, a, we've got a lot of different, um, species specific or even just, you know, generalist, um, viruses and bacteria and funguses and, you know, moving fish around, um, never a good thing. Never a good thing. Nope. Now we're talking about the diets of these fish and we've talked about, you know, the black crappie eating more invertebrates and bugs, et cetera, mm -hmm. and the white crappie eating fish. Now, how many shad hatches do you predict happen? You know, because up until yep. January 1st, I was catching the healthiest fish I've caught in eight years guiding. At that time of year, the shad were still present. They were everywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. huge balls of these uh, shad. And, you know, at that time, they were three to three and a half inches. And these crappie yep. are just hammering them. And I was just kind of wondering if you had an approximate answer on how many shad hatches were per year. I will, this is one of the few times I can give you an exact answer. Excellent. One. <laughs> is that right? It, that's a, it's a common misconception. And Matt, I'm going to come completely straight with you here. I thought there was the possibility of them spawning a second time. And I looked through the literature and from what I found, it is they spawn once. Now, spawn once that bell curve can be pretty wide. From what I found, they can the actual timing of the spawn can be weeks, three, four weeks or more. Um, so so then you kind of get into the, you know, so so really what I'm saying is an individual gizzard shaft is spawning once. But that time frame, you know what I mean, where the actual okay. shaft is spawning. Okay. So if you had a big peak in early spawn and then another peak later, you could, I mean, you know, do you want to call that two spawns? Maybe. But it, each each individual gizzard shad is only spawning once in a year. Okay. They're not producing eggs again and spawning a second time that same season. Um, so I guess it's not as an exact <laughs> answer as I thought, but definitely the the individual fish are not spawning more than once. I would that is something I'm so happy to know because I tell people four to six because we keep seeing more shad the later in the summer it goes, and literally. 50 yards wide, 100 feet long. Dustin, right. you've been on the boat. Yep. Yep. It looks like an oil spill <laughs> yeah. out there. You know, like, and it's a it whole yeah. mass of shad. They have that iridescence. You know? Yes, you know, and yep. it it's amazing that you catch a fish during the summer with as many shad that are in there, but you catch them just as like yeah. you do in any other time of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, when you know, when we do our fall surveys, just to kind of give an example, um, you know, needless to say, when we're out electrofishing, we catch a few gizzard shad, right? <laughs> they're all sure, over the place. Sure. Not to. Usually we, we go for about a minute, if that, and we go, all right, they're subsampled. We're done after we fill a tub of them. And, uh, you know, when we measure all, all those fish out, you know, so, sometimes it'll be dependent on the year. Um, but typically we're going to be seeing gizzard shad um, 80 to 110 millimeters is, is kind of that range of those yearling or young, it'd be young a year, I guess, in the fall. Um, and so, you know, you're, that'd be what? But, well, like you said, between three and four inches. Right. 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 <laughs> That's basically three to four inch. Um, and yeah, those are all from one possibly protracted, but one, um, you know, one spawn. And then what time of year does that one spawn take place? Oh, boy. Um, so again, it is going to be based off of water temperature. Okay. And, and what is, and I, I forget what it is for gizzard chat off my head. I, I, what I do know is the, and, and it's, what's really cool with the timing of, of fish spawns is they've basically be, been evolved to hatch so that 
their food source is hatched right before them so that there's a lot of it right right so those gizzard shad um and i've, I've seen this you've probably seen it when you're fishing that pre-spawn getting close to being into the spawn the gizzard shad are spawning yep so yep. if i had to put a you know in the 50s um yep. you know i, I mean i Honestly, a Google search will tell you as much. You know what I mean? You're, you're going to get a wide range. It's going to depend on where you're at. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's a temperature range where it's typical, but it's going to be right before the crappie with the idea being that and and, and, and probably overlaps, I should say, with the crappie. It does well. because you see them in there just going crazy, mm -hmm. like literally thrashing the shoreline, the, the yeah. mud and the two inches of water. You see more shad out of the water than you do its yeah. body in it. You know, it's really getting yep. in there. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've had my pant legs get wet at Charleston side channel. Cause I'm standing, you know, right on the edge of the shore and a school of gizzard chat will come in and they're just spraying eggs everywhere and splashing water. And, yep. you know, it's like you're at sea world and, and it, they're doing that all up and down, you know, rip rap. And, um, yeah. And I, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, the, the egg numbers and, you know, gizzard chat or anything, but they have a lot of eggs. There's a lot of gizzard chat. Right. Right. <laughs> and that's what leads right to those, right. those giant schools of gizzard chat that we see. And one of the most important parts of the, the gizzard chat isn't necessarily the number. I mean, it is if they're low, right? But typically we've got a lot of gizzard chat. The question is how big are they? Because as soon as those gizzard chat um, surpass what we call the gape limitation of a fish. So basically what they can fit in their mouth. Right. That's not food anymore. Right. right? Um, and so, you know, with, with gizzard chad and as you know, just like with any other fish, um, that's going to be uh, density dependent a lot of times, right? So if you have a spawn with a lot of gizzard chad, they may be a little bit smaller that year. They may be a little bit more um, available or for a longer period, um, right? You know, um, so that's kind of some of just some of the things, right? We're looking at when we're doing these surveys and and that sort of thing. You know, you just mentioned on something because during the summer. Up until a certain point, that minnow is really a really hard bite to beat, especially as a guide, getting people sure. to giz, catch as many fish as possible. But then, like you said, once that gizzard shad, you know, breaks that gape mm -hmm. uh, entrance for each fish, you know, in the black crappie, the gape is even smaller than the white crappie's mouth. You know what I mean? So, you know, that black and they switch to, they switch to fish later too. Yep. So. Right. You know, it seems like at a turning point, the fish stop worrying about the minnow and they start going down into this, you know, matching the hatch up to a certain point, you know, and yeah. then that's interesting. So you, and I'm, I'm thinking about that more now. You're thinking the black crappie have a smaller mouth. Yes, sir. Interesting. That's that awesome. is not something I've ever looked at or anything that maybe yeah. that's, that might be the mechanism behind not switching to Pisever. And that's, that's why I always assume they, really they were in the bugs and, uh, invertebrates more right. so, but yeah, look at the, right. Oh, I probably we could probably Google search, you know, what's a 12 inch gape and a black and a white crappie, you know, but right. You know, oh, I, I've, I've already got it in my head. I'm going to write that down. There you go. Next time we do a survey. Cause that's, that's something really interesting to look at. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've just, and that's something I've noticed just as a guide, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, I got a 12 inch crappie that's white and a 12 inch crappie that's black. And it is a noticeable difference in the size of the mouth. That's that gape. Yeah. I would even say it's probably as close to a third of a difference. Interesting. Yes. And, you yeah. know, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking back now to all these fish and I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's going to be interesting. I, there may even be research. I'll have to look that up. Mm -hmm. If I find anything, I'll be sure to share it with well, you. That's but yeah, what I got a lot of, that's... a lot of you guys that I've talked to, that's, that's a, a common, that's what everybody said. Yeah. So smaller I, hair jigs, uh, smaller one inch yeah. baits, yeah. you know, we're in there trying to get them shallower black crappie. It's all yeah. about factors, you know, knowing all this data and information is fantastic, but you also have to kind of put a little fishing tip in there. If you're mm -hmm. fishing shallow and you're around black crappie, you want to downsize because that gape is smaller and that crappie is only right. going to go after a bait that it can, you know, really handle. Right. right. And it's, you know, that's, that's what they're targeting too, right? Exactly. If they're, if they're targeting inverts versus fish, exactly. their normal prey isn't as big too. Right. Right. So color combinations and and sizes. and yeah, and the color all, combinations all changes, may be different. Yeah. Too. You know, we use a lot of dark dark colors when we're mm -hmm. fishing for black crappie. You know, like thinking of any bug, a dark profile mm -hmm. is usually the color of any type of bug around here. But hey, uh, sure. before we get too far along with this, can you tell us the lake record for white and black crappie? Well, yes. <laughs> So um, the lake record is actually, that's all um, recorded. That's, that's the, the core does that. Yeah. Um, that being said, um, the record, I've got it written over here. <laughs> it, it was 
two pounds, 2.72 ounces, caught by Mark Brown on May 15th of 2014, according to my notes. <laughs> okay. Um, however, a 2.88 pound crappie um, was caught. May 4th. It was, 20, last year? it was last year in the fireman tournament. Okay. Yeah. In the yep. fireman. I was thinking, I couldn't remember if that was last year or two years ago. Last year. All running together. Yeah. Last year. A 288. Um, 288. Yep. And I, oh, it was such a, such a funny side story with that. I don't get, I get, I don't get out fishing very often. I finally got a, I got a boat for the first time. Had my, had a boat last year, just nothing fancy. I'm out with my father-in-law at Lake Charleston during the spawn. Um, just got off work, went, met out there and we're not on the water 10 minutes. And my work phone, because I carry it all the time, is blowing up. Numbers I don't recognize. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. So finally, I pick up, and I, I'm trying to remember. Was it you, Matt? Yeah, my, you yeah, me? it was me. I was trying to figure out how do we certify a fish. Right. So I, I think maybe you left me a message, and then I answered when a CPO or vice versa. Anyways, yeah, it was because yep, of that fish, they were trying to figure out how to certify That's exactly it. it. Yeah. Well, that yeah. was a so question was, I, was was gonna cool. I was going to ask. I was going to ask, how how do we certify a fish uh, at the lake? Of, you know? Yeah. So for lake records, I talked to uh, I talked to the Corps about this to find out the exact process. Basically, it needs to be weighed on a certified scale. Um, now, where that can be found, you know, a meat market, uh, you know, anywhere that will let you put a fish on their scale, right, on a, on a certified scale. Um, you know, if, if I happen to be able to make it out there, I do have a certified scale here at my office in Charleston. Um, you know, the main purpose for that is if we have a state record come in, you know, we need to have a certified scale to weigh it on, um, you know. So, yeah, if it's a state record fish, you're going to want to reach out to your district biologist. If you can't get a hold of them, a CPO, you know, that's on duty, they may be able to get a, a hold of them. And um, you want to yeah, video it. Is, that's correct, right? Well, yeah. So they were saying, yeah, there has to be some, I guess some of them might print like a, a deli label. Yeah. Put the weight on there yep. for it or something like that. So yep. I think it's, it's kind of, you know, dependent. I would reach out to the core you know, to find out exactly how they want you to, to do that. But yeah, that's the gist of it is it's got to be, you know, certified, maybe a witness or two or whatever, now, you know, on a certified scale. Didn't you say that uh, now we've got to check to see if it's a, a, a black or, or a hybrid? Yeah. So for state records, that's true because they are kept separate. Okay. Um, the lake records are a little bit more informal, you know, mm. it's just kind of a, a cool, you know, thing. So they actually just, they have a crappie record. So it negates, you know, if, if it's a black, white or a hybrid, um, you know, that's, that's, it's all, all just under one record. So um, if I had to make a guess, I'd say that last fish was a hybrid it, from photos. It appears this fish that's is what I thought it was, too. was a hybrid, Yep. Um, you know, and I, I say all this about hybrids. If you don't run a genetics test, right. It, you can't, you know, scientifically, you can't say that for sure, but right. It certainly seems that way. <laughs> you know, just the disparity of one uh, characteristic of one fish wasn't there. For me, you know, I could see mm -hmm. two, I could see what I would consider a hybrid. But again, like you say, the yeah. eye can be fooled, you know. Right, right. And then, you know, something cool with the the way the, the core, um, you know, the lake record goes. So um, if you do catch one, that fish, um, then you give it to the core. Um, they have somebody, I believe, that does the taxidermy. Don't quote me on that. But I believe they have the taxidermy done. And that fish then um, stays at the visitor center in their, in their visitors. You know, they've got all the lake records and, and whatever that room, I don't know the name of it. They got a really cool room there. Really cool out. room. Very um, cool. Yeah. A lot of cool stuff in there. Um, great for kids too. So I highly recommend checking that out. Um, but then that, that mount stays there until it's beat. So Mark Brown probably is, if he hasn't already is pretty soon getting his mount back. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> he's beaten. Yeah. Hey, Jimmy here, we're going to close out in one, one question here. Um, All right. Besides a selective harvest, how and what can anglers do to keep the crappie population trending upwards? Sure. Um, obviously, right, this is a complex question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, you know, I mean, the, the first thing I'll say is follow the regulations. Yep. Um, you know, there's a reason the regulations are selected. I promise you, I mean, I'm not going to, I can't speak for the world, but I can promise you that if we're putting a regulation or have a regulation on a lake, there is a reason behind it. And I'm not saying we're perfect. Um, and, you know, just because regulation changes a few times, that may be the plan. Um, you know, so far, I'd say what we've got going on on Shelbyville is working pretty good. Um, you know, so, something that makes regulations really hard is, you know, let's say we've got a certain amount of fishing pressure and then you change a regulation. 
well, that trip regulation can then also change the way the fishing pressure, right? Not just what you can keep, but maybe the number of people that are keeping or fishing that lake or, you know, it's just, there's a lot of variables. Um, when it comes to crappie, they have um, what's often referred to as um, quasi-cyclic, meaning cyclic, but not regularly. <laughs> so basically they have very um, variable recruitment. Um, we have been lucky from what I have seen um, through my thesis work. And then, you know, the last survey we did Asian fish, the white crappie seem to be pretty stable as far as recruitment, you know, reproduction. Um, the black crappie, like we said, it looked like we had a bad year in 2018. Um, you know, so, so that's all stuff out of our, out of our hands. That's going to happen. You know, it's, it's going to be controlled more than likely by variables outside of, of our control, how those spawns go. Um, so, you know, following the regulations is going to be a big one. Um, you know, as far as keeping crappie, right. Um, I hear, I hear both sides and both are right. Both are wrong. <laughs> um, you know, uh, people, some people reach out and they're like, oh my gosh, the lake is getting hammered. We're going to run out of crappie. Um, to those folks, I say not necessarily. And so far that's not, there's no indication of that. And the reason for that is there's a lot of crappie crappie have a lot of eggs and they're spawning really well. And if we don't keep, you know, a particularly in that, um, two to three in, or two, sorry, two to three year old range, not two to three inch, <laughs> two to three year old range, um, you know, and kind of thinning those down a little bit so that, you know, they're, they're kind of relieved for, for, for growth, you know, um, as they get older, um, you know, that's, that's one common way for, for populations to get something. Um, you know, so that harvest, you know, is helping. And that's one of the reasons why we have that, you know, over under limit is to kind of encourage folks to keep some of them, you know, maybe borderline playable fish, right. um, you know, to some folks to help kind of thin that number down a little bit and give us good growth rates while, you know, then the over being obviously, you know, being able to catch your, your, your larger fish, um, you know, uh, others, others, well, and then on that note too, you know, a lot of people that go out crappie fishing and I feel like they maybe don't think about it and they just, they keep them, right. That's what you do with crappie. You don't have to, you know, no, you don't um, there's have no point to. wasting, there's no point wasting those fillets, you know, I, what I would do, this is the perfect time. You know, if, if I'm an angler, I'd go look in your freezer. If you've got 30 pounds of crappie mm -hmm. in your freezer still, you right. already did it. Yeah. You don't you need, need, you don't need yourself, to keep any. You should be filleting fish this right. spring. Right. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll be, I'll tell you right now, I'm a little guilty of that. I've got more crappie in my fillet or my freezer still than I really thought I would. Um, you know, so I probably won't be filleting as many fish this, this spring. Um, but you know, that's, that's, that's another thing to, to just kind of think about is, you know, yeah, thank you. Harvest. You know, on that selective harvest, kind of what I'm talking about is I really focus on that during the spawn. If we catch a big female, she's full of eggs. We get a picture, mm -hmm. we get her right back in there. That fish has made it four and a half years, maybe five years. And she's full mm -hmm. of eggs. She has great genetics. Uh, she's going to hold a larger amount of eggs. So there's going to be more eggs with a greater percentage mm -hmm. of chance to actually live. And, uh, so like you say, we do need to take fish out of the lake. We do need to take some of those smaller fish out of the lake as well. You know, you can, I'm, I'm about a nine and between a nine and a quarter and nine and a half is where I'll start keeping them, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, yep. unless the day's tougher, maybe you keep a nine inch fish if the client's fish hungry, but you know, any true monsters, I've had several fish get mounted uh, from being a guide, and I've had a mm -hmm. lot of clients, they take the privilege of wanting to release that fish because yep. I, t I do tell them that 14-inch crappie is not going to taste near as good as this next 10-and-a-half-inch crappie you're about to catch. Mm -hmm. you right, know? right. So, so that's, that topic, it comes up a lot, and that's going to be one of the ones I'm going to fence it on. So I... I agree and understand where both sides of that argument comes from. So on the one side, absolutely. You got this bigger fish. It's got more eggs, you know, especially, especially if it's a female, right. And during the spawn, you can tell pretty well um, if it still has eggs, especially, um, you know, it's a bigger fish and you can't, you can't have 14 inch fish if you're eating all the 12s and 13s, right. That's, right. that's just common sense. That's how, that's how it works. Um, you know, so if you want to throw those bigger fish back, absolutely agree and understand with that. Now, the other side of the argument is, you know, these fish just naturally aren't going to live much past, you know, maybe five or six. So if you want to harvest that fish, you know, it, it you know, it, it, especially, you know, you get into this, well, during the spawn, you know, do we need more eggs or not? You know, there's probably way more eggs dropped and hatched, you know, wherever that bottleneck is, 
it probably bottlenecks down to relatively the same number just because of how much food there is, you know, compared to the variation in eggs. So, you know, whether or not we need that many eggs or not is an argument that could be made, um, sure. you know, and I, again, I could see either side of that. And then, you know, if that fish is four years old, five years old, it may not live another year. Right. Um, you know what I mean? It's probably going to naturally die. So if you want to harvest it, I don't lose much sleep over it. Now, you know, there's other species, right? You know, let's say walleye and, and sauger, right? Those those fish can, you know, it, basically it all comes down to growth trajectories. And if you look at, and, and I actually sent, um, I don't know if we ever really touched, but I, I sent some of the growth growth curves, um, you know, for for the growth on, on crappie and, and Shelbyville. By the time they're hitting age four, they're not going to add very much that, that next year or two. You know, they're basically, they're at sub, you know, they're adding a, a tenth or two of an inch from, from what we're seeing, you know, that the, the way that growth works, it just kind of peters out, you know, it keeps going, but it's going to be very slow. You know, that 13 inch isn't going to be a 14 the next year, more than likely. Um, and with them only living out to six. So that's both sides of it. You know what I mean? Right. Um, right. I, I'm not, I'm not die hard on either side. Cause I understand both, um, it, you know, and it's. I'm exactly the the with day. you on that, Jimmy, because as, as a guide, I've got people that want to catch the first 10 overs and going in the box. Mm -hmm. And I got mm -hmm. first five unders going in the box, you know, like right. they, they come fish hungry and I respect that. Like, I think there's probably more big fish dying of old age than that get caught. Mm -hmm. You know, that's right. just, that's just something to think about, you know? Yep. Because yeah. And the, the other thing with, you know, we, we say the bigger fish and, and then equate that to the older fish. There is a huge overlap between the length of two and a half, three and a half and four and a half year old fish. Um, I mean, huge, you know, if you look at the, the graph I sent, you can kind of see where that overlap is. I mean, there are, there are 12, 13 inch fit or close to that. At least I'm trying to do math in my head. That might be two and a half inch or two and a half years old in the fall. You know, they're, they're, they're getting, you know, that at least 10 or 11 inch. They're Whenever just they're, like humans. You know, they're going to have that, yep. you know, that I don't want to say freak, you know, but it's going to be a genetic Plus, right. you know, you're going to right, have right. The, the outliers, on the, the outliers of the yeah. range. Yep. 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 Yeah. And so, you know, at the same time, you might have a uh, fish that's only 10 inches and maybe that's a four and a half year old. Right. You know what I mean? Um, as far as genetics go, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I don't, there hasn't been much shown that, you know, these, these larger growing fish necessarily lead to, um, better genetics you know, offspring, yeah better genetics you okay. know there, there'd have to be a lot of work looking at whether the the male or female carries those genes how they're passed on okay. and then I, I still don't know if we'd ever reach a point where angling would be able to affect it right because again you're keeping anything in that nine inch plus range could be two three or four and by the time you can figure that out and pull their ear bones out they don't release very well <laughs> right, right <laughs> and there's not right. much other way to figure that out that's right um you know, so yeah, at the end of the day, do, do whatever you feel is best, you know, on, on either side of those and, um, follow the regulations. Things. Yeah. Follow the regulations. Go out. That's it. Yeah. Go out, involve youth, have fun. That's right. <laughs> right. That's Absolutely. some that's days you're going to catch 200 out. fish and you're going to remember that day for the rest of your life. There's going to be days you catch two fish that you're going to remember for the rest of your life. You know, it's yeah. just. It's just the way it is. It's fishing, not catching. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Man, this has been this has been great. I know uh, our listeners are going to be super. You you helped you helped me out. I, I mean, I think I got more questions now. I, I want to continue this, but we we do have <laughs> other things that we've got to do today. Uh, I thank you for coming on here, and hopefully, maybe we could uh, do this again in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm I'm here anytime. Love talking about this stuff, getting good information out. Um, and yeah, if folks have questions, you know, because I know we're I'm gonna we're gonna get more I, once this comes out. They're gonna say, "Yo, what about this? Yep. What about this?" And so I, I'd love to have you back on. And, I already have more questions do, in my head than, I, we, right. than we asked today. Right. So. I was just sitting here, you know, just absorbing a lot of this, and uh, it was great great stuff yep. uh thank you again yeah and, jimmy thank you as much it was even more than i anticipated yeah, you know thank yeah. you for everything it was a uh, very informative and that's what we need need informative educational seminars like this you know exactly. on this platform that can really help yep. educate people on you know uh the ins and outs of crappie it's it, it helps it helps the the 
the professional like Matt and the novice like myself, uh, just knowing, you know, getting, getting this information and just becoming better anglers. So once again, sure. thank you. And, uh, hope to do it again soon. Thanks guys. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Jerry. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a good day. Bye. You too. See Bye. you. Bye.